Hello, good morning. Today our guest is Razib Khan. Hello, Razib. How are you doing? Hey, Lipton. How are you? I'm great. Razib, I've been reading your work for some time now. You wrote for Hoon Review in the past. You have written for the Gene Literacy Project. And Razib, your work is fairly standard. I don't view you as a radical, and I've read many. So I can't understand the controversy surrounding your personality. This will not form a, a great part of the debate, but I just have to ask the question because your findings are quite standard in genetics. Um, you know, I mean, I think uh, <laughs> people try to present their work uh, in a particular way to align with a, um, you know, normative view or a hegemonic ideology, and I don't really do that. And so... Uh, that's a problem because everyone is supposed to be on the same page, to be frank. Yes. All right, then. So we're going to start with an article you wrote for an academic for an academic audience titled Consumer Genomics Will Change Your Life, Whether You Get Tested or Not. Why is this so? Um, basically, the issue here is consumer genomics is just part of the ecosystem of data that is going to be all around you as you proceed into the 21st century. So in medical health, for example, they routinely do tests. So you go to the doctor and they're like, oh, can we give tests? But one of the tests that they will do is they will ask you, um, you know, can you can we get do a genetic test on you, uh, just a whole genome test? And this stuff was, uh, was pioneered in the consumer genomic space. So it was normalized uh, by the fact that millions of people have done consumer genomics tests. And the technology itself was actually perfected uh, expanded and extended by the demand the demand placed on the um, you know production system by consumer genomics, and so the protocols, the methods, the technologies, even the expectations are shaped by consumer genomics, even in something like the medical field. And so, it's true that a lot of people aren't interested in uh, genetic genealogy; they don't want to know their disease risk. But most people do go to the doctor, and once you go to the doctor, you're going to have a situation where they will probably ask you if you want to do a whole genome test. Uh, instead of doing like some like, you know, biopsy, um, they might just ask if you want to do like, you know, some tissue samples uh, from just like very, very micro, micro samples from a few parts of your body to get whole genome sequence to see if there's any mutations. This stuff is going to be um, ubiquitous, uh, constant, and uh, banal. Uh, people are going to get used to it. And I think the fact that you know, right now, 30 to 40 million Americans, like 10% of the population have done consumer genomics tests, really, really makes it normalized for people. Uh, you know, something you talk about over Thanksgiving, um, over Christmas, that sort of thing. Yeah, and I view the revolution in consumer genomics as another form of marketing. So for example, when products are placed within a certain part of a supermarket, people are more likely to purchase it. So I don't think that this is highly controversial, but then again, I don't find many issues to be controversial. Well, I mean, so the issue with consumer genomics is people view their genetic code as something very private and special. And I do think it's important, but I also don't think it's magic. But people think it's magic in terms of um, they think the genetic code has some power over you and someone who has your genetic code has power over you. And so um, I think that's the logic. I think it's kind of superstitious, frankly, but um, that's not relevant uh, to, to the average person out there. The average person out there doesn't know how the technology works. Yeah, they only see what's in the advertisements. They only like know what their relatives tell them over Thanksgiving. And so, I mean, obviously you're not mystified by it. But a lot of people are mystified by it. And so we're gonna have a situation where uh, the technology will expand into people's lives but, um, you know, there's going to be controversy, resistance, confusion. There will be uh, protocols related to privacy, access. You know, it's not like the internet because the internet is awesome and incredible when people first encounter it. But, um, you know, they don't really care about how the data packets are transferred around the internet. Uh, all they care about is the end result. So with consumer genomics, the end result is super important, whether you have a risk, uh, who you're related to, uh, but people also have an almost um, mystical, ontological, you know, concern about the sequence, because the sequence is them. It's their sequence. 
Uh, it's not just a technology that's producing output. The output starts with them. It's a sequence they themselves carry and they can understand that at that very, very high level. But I think that also causes concern. Yes, privacy rights are, are important. There, there are some who would debate the right to privacy. So for example, privacy is a function of having a right to property. It is not a standalone right. So if Johnny and Mary were having sex in a public park and Judy took a photo, that's debatable. Did Judy really breach their right to privacy? I would say no, because there's a reasonable expectation that if you're in public, people are going to look at you. Yeah, I mean, I think um, you're making a fair point. So when people say, for example, um, if I like my 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 genome is out there, like you can Google Razib Khan genotype and you can find all the different file formats. That means that half of my siblings genome is out there. Literally half of my parents genome is out there. Um, you know, half of my children's genome is out there. So I made an, a decision for myself that impacted my whole family. And so the question here is, should I be allowed to make that decision? I think I should because, I mean, it's my, my genome, it's my body. I can do whatever I want with it. But, um, you know, people have argued that you need to get consent from your extended family. That's an argument. I, I don't agree with it. But, um, you know, if genome is, your genome is just not about you, also just by looking at someone, uh, you can tell a lot about them. So they obviously don't have... You know, like you look at me, you know what part of the world I'm probably from. You can make all sorts of inferences about my genetics from that. Uh, does that mean that you violated my privacy? No. Um, so uh, these concepts come from human society, human construction, obviously. And so they're awkward fits on something natural like your genome. Exactly. And because medical research is advancing, genomics can assist us in longitudinal studies. So for example, we know of data for the great grandparent, the grandparent, the parent, and the children. So we can track how diseases progress or regress within a family for several years. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the conundrums is People don't want to participate in a lot of these studies or, or you know, do genomic sequencing um, because they don't feel like they get anything out of it and they're just giving up their sequence. But the issue is, as long as they don't give up their sequence, we're not going to get anything out of it. It's kind of a catch-22 uh, where the more data we have, the more we can get out of it. But we can't get more out of it until we have more data, and people won't provide data until like they can be convinced. So you know, some nations, um, you know, have like socialized, centralized healthcare systems, and they're trying to give nudges to people. I think what might happen eventually is people might just be given um, given monetary inducements. You know, like oh, we'll give you like a hundred dollars or two hundred dollars if you get your genome sequenced and put it in the national data bank or whatever or in our regional data bank, um, you know, something like that. I think that might induce enough people uh, to get involved. And, you know, a, a company like Facebook has a lot of data on your behavior, especially if you're a boomer, if you're older, because they still use Facebook. Um, they can't, I know that they can cross it if they wanted to with genetic data, if they could get that. Uh, we could get a lot of insights about the relationship to behavior or between behavior and genes just from all the data we have. Basically what I'm saying is we have the technology. Do you wanna execute it? Do you wanna do the logistics? Do you wanna go through the internal review boards academically, all these ethical concerns? That's a different question. All right, Razib, are you interested in microevolutionary processes? I am quite interested in understanding these processes and I don't like to speculate. And mm -hmm. one way to prevent me from speculating is genomics. We have data to track how poverty and the environment can impact genes. Yeah, um, so if you're talking about impact genes like epigenetics, is that what you're asking about? Yes, epi yes that's, that's one of the features I'm, I'm referring to. But okay. more broadly, I'm saying because of the revolution in genomics, we can track the relationship and the and we can track the relationship between genes and the environment over a longer period of time and we don't need to speculate anymore. Yeah, um, so how we're gonna do that is probably various types of um, epigenomic sequencing. Um, I think, yeah, yeah, I'm not like totally up on the technology, but there's various ways to do methylome sequencing. Um, so yeah, we're gonna be able to do all this. What are we gonna find? So in terms of epigenetics, um, 
epigenetics is a really sexy field. Um, the, the, the short answer is it has a non-trivial effect on your life course because it impacts gene expression, how the genes turn on or off in your body. Um, it probably doesn't have any heritable impact. Uh, so there is a study from the Dutch famine that shows some intergenerational transmission of epigenetic effects. Uh, people that I talk to who work in epigenetics, who work in this area, they think that that's probably not gonna be a replicable study. The study methodology was fine, but um, as you know, with the replication crisis, sometimes so stuff turns out to be statistically significant randomly. There's no real mechanism in humans. They know that the transmission could have worked, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so there's probably no intergenerational transmission of characteristics epigenetically, but it affects things that happen in your life. So if you go through some sort of shock, um, like, you know, something like smoking can be a shock. So you can might see epigenetic marks of like stress that in your cells, um, maybe in your lungs due to smoking. Um, so that's, that's how you can see the effect of epigenetics over your lifetime. I think what will probably happen um, will be regular time course samplings. Um, and I don't think they'll have to do that much tissue draw at all. Um, the techniques are getting so good uh, of just like getting it from, you know, minimal number of cells uh, and they're just gonna sequence. And, um, you know, what they're gonna be monitoring for is like, you know, what is there a change due to, like maybe you have a cancer. I mean, it's unlikely with a small sequence that I think you're gonna get it early, um, but you know, it, they're probably gonna use genomics as part of a broader suite of tools to track like what kind of, I think the term they would call is insults, uh, what kind of th things are happening in your life? Um, did you have like a huge infection that might've changed something? And that might not be, that might not be sequencing related. Um, but yeah, it's gonna be part of a whole ecosystem of, um, of information and genomics and, uh, Epigenomics, epigenetics, th these matter because they're kind of at the root of a lot of biochemical processes, as you know, right? Like in terms of like, okay, like how does the protein get generated? Well, you start with the DNA sequence. Um, how does the tissue get differentiated? Well, you look at how the genes are being expressed. And so um, we're going to do downstream checking uh, of like protein levels and biomarkers, but people are also going to check the genes. Yeah, exactly my point. And Razib, genetics, the, the revolution in genetics also has implications for historical research. So historians and economists often work together to quantify studies. But based on my survey of the data, many of these studies are speculative. So for example, I'm not saying that this study is speculative. I do believe that the research is up to par, but Nathan Nunn argues that there's a relationship between the slave trade and mistrust today in Africa. You know, the, in the sense that because of the slave trade, it made sense for one to be less trusting. That's the argument of Nathan Nunn. But with the revolution in ge ge genetics, we don't need to speculate anymore. And econ ec quantitative studies, they become secondary because we now have good data on genes. Mm -hmm. Well, so how would you, like, so what are you thinking about in particular in relation to the slave state? trade, trade, and that study. Like, I, can, I have some ideas, yeah. but, but yes, tell also, me what you're thinking. Well, so, well, Nathan, Nathan Nunn already tested it, but I have a very interesting theory. So my theory is this. During the pre-colonial era in, in Africa and other parts of the world, countries that were more likely to reform their economies and appropriate technologies for, from other states are better off today. And I would love to know if over time, reception to innovation changes our culture and may or if it may have an impact an impact on genetic development so for example re recently i was speaking to diego Komin, and diego Komin, is an economist he's not really interested in genetics and where i was arguing that affluent environments select for cultures that are more innovative and creative so this is I sound a bit verbose but i believe you, you get the point i want to know if there's a relationship between the openness to technology and long-term growth and if and if we can observe that link to culture or genetics yeah so i mean openness like how would we figure this out so um we can like think about this in terms of like okay so there's a big five personality construct do you think that's statistically robust let's assume you do um so openness is one of the constructs then you figure out like what the heritability of openness is um i believe it's like 0 0.2 0 0.3 last i checked Okay, so if it's heritable, that means some of it's due to genetic variants. Um, you do like really like big genome-wide associations. 
look for genes um, that are enriched, you know, that are uh, found, um, you know, in, in these, you know, in people who tend to be more open. And then you can look across populations and see if there's variation in those genes. Now, does that explain most of the variants? No, obviously not. But um, the genes are kind of tracers or indicators of possible differences. And so, you know, we could do this if we wanted to. Um, obviously, for political reasons, I think people would be I mean, I know people, I know concretely of academics who think about looking at personality variation by population and they've been told not to, so. Yeah, like Diego, Diego is super smart, but he was hesitant to really take on some of my ideas. But then he said that he's going to edit the video and he may select some of them. But I don't like to speculate. If Why speculate when we have access to data? That doesn't make any sense. Um, if well, we don't have access to all the, the, so the data needs to be joined. And so what people are going to, you know, what people would say is like, you shouldn't join some of the data because you don't know what you're going to find. But, yeah, but that, you know, yeah. as a researcher, you're interested in producing quality research, but research is, all, is also a risk. And I don't have a problem with being wrong. It's a part of the research process. Um, yeah, I mean, that's fine. I mean, I agree with you, but that's not how academia works today. Yeah, I, I know, but like... Razib, I am more data driven, so I can tell you about your work, but I cannot say that Razib likes this person on, on Twitter or he's against that person. I'm not interested in personalities. Yeah. Yeah, just strict, strictly academic research and, and data. So, for example, there is an economist called ClickGuard, and he has done some work on the relationship between genes and well-being and he's an economist and his research is pretty old by academic standards and if we have sufficient data to assist people like ClickGuard, then we should invest in the research yeah i mean sure i mean it's we should but we probably won't not in this country <laughs> Yeah, so, so for example, Razib, are you familiar with the work of Spola Hori on genetic distance? Um, I think I've seen it before. He's an economist, right? Yes, the yes. Genetic, genetic distance. Okay, yeah. So I, I haven't like read it in detail. Um, I'm not sure if it's robust work, but um, you know, the the method isn't crazy. I'm not sure if the work is robust though. Yeah, but you see, people. And people like Enrico need guys like yourself in genetics to partner with them to do research. Sure. The good thing about Enrico is that Enrico is a distinguished economist and is maybe over 60s or elderly. And the, the people who are interested in this type of research are old. They are the established. And because of political correctness, when Enrico and his group of colleagues pass, I don't, I am yet to identify someone who is brave enough to, to take up the mantle. Because I mean, you, you yeah, may go ahead. Yeah, the, the problem is they're not brave enough because you can't do it as an individual. And the whole culture right now of younger <laughs> academics is not, you know what it's like. Yeah, yeah. So, so for example, like David Landes wrote a book, The Wealth and Poverty of Nations, and people accuse him of being Eurocentric. But if David were alive today, we would be reading a splendid book on the real role between culture and development because we have the data. We have data showing that people from individualistic countries are more likely to engage in creative activities. We have data showing that the country of ancestry is linked to fertility rates. We have the data. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we have a lot of data, but that's, again, um, just because we have the data doesn't mean people will execute because uh, people are worried about the consequences of the data. Um, and that's more important for a lot of people. You know, let me, let me give you a concrete example. Um, you know, it's, it's very ideological, but there was a paper in some bioethics journal that I saw a couple of days ago, and it suggested that, um, you know, they argued for affirmative affirmation of gender identity or something, and that parents who do not affirm the gender identity or allow their child to explore should have their children taken away. This paper was was published to no protest because of ideological reasons. So people know what can be published because of ideological priors and that's what they do because, you know, um, what academics produce are papers and you have to produce papers that can be published and won't get you um, censured by your peers. And um, the pressure to censure is strong. So, you know, we have the data, we're not gonna do it in this country. 
So yeah, yeah, that's but, but a fact. Yeah, and there. But what's interesting is that many scientific journals are taking opinions that are not only poli politically correct, but also inaccurate. So, for example, we do know that trans people, if they're given time, will eventually identify like their will eventually identify to their real sex. This is not made up research. Yeah, but and, I mean, and a, yeah, and forcing children to affirm the opposite sex could harm them in the long term. Yeah, I mean, I don't know much about this topic, but that sounds reasonable. Um, and yes, it's very ideological. One reason I don't know much about this topic is I just don't believe anything that's published. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think it's quite silly. I respect the right of people to choose, but a man can never become a woman. Mm. You, 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 you can't change your sex. So for example, I could never identify as, as an Indian, neither could I identify as a 75 year old man. The law doesn't, <laughs> yes, you're laughing because I say 75 years. People who don't like silver, I'm in my 20s, but it, for a long- Lipton, Lipton, age is just a number. Open <laughs> yeah, your mind. Yeah, but for a long time, Rosie, before my face was shown, it was assumed that I was a very old white man. Even when I wrote pieces in Jamaica, people asked me that I was old. I don't know mm -hmm. why. You have an old soul. <laughs> yeah, they, they. You, you, you know, like there was always signs that you were actually an old person on the inside, <laughs> you know, and you just had to kind of like awaken to it. And um, you've had some issues with people erasing your old identity <laughs> because of your external present presentation. <laughs> so eloquently said. But Rajiv, on a serious note, about what? Maybe... Three or two years ago, three three years ago or more, I read an article in the Project Syndicate lamenting the decline of scientific innovations. And recently, I read an article by a German academic, and he was arguing that it's becoming harder to find innovations. Do you have an issue on the topic? Why is science not progressing? So I think there's two issues, um, two broad issues. Uh, one is. Uh, structural to science or structural to the world. Um, so I don't know. I mean, obviously, you know, SpaceX and Virgin and th these companies are doing great things, but there's obviously a limitation in physics uh, in terms of um, how much bang for the buck we can get uh, in terms of uh, engineering uh, on the margin with like say density of the atmosphere. That's not changing, right? We can't magically create anti-gravity, at least to our knowledge, we can't. And so um, there are some physical limits to what we can do with some types of physical science. And I think we're pushing up against it. Um, you know, I, we know this with, uh, you know, with Moore's law, it's been improving, you know, the computer, computer engineers have been improving computers uh, using multiple different techniques, not one technique because they run up against limits, right? So I think that that's a thing and that's not, um, that's not always an issue though. So uh, the other issue is the institution of modern science, which has become institutionalized over the last century. And uh, it's gotten some really, really uh, messed up incentives in terms of how the funding works, in terms of funding cycles, in terms of who's promoted, in terms of the overall culture. And it's slowly and fast um, over various times, I think gotten worse. So there's a selection effect of who stays in academic science, uh, the culture, how it shifts, um, the importance of group norms, also the, the, the funding, so as you know, um, you have an area of research and you have a bunch of researchers in that area and they're applying for grants and the people evaluating those grants are the researchers in that area. And so, okay, um, everybody in that area has a particular idea of what the truth probably is and what they're pushing towards. And so they're going to fund those grants and out of the box ideas yeah they might fund one here or there but in general it's going to be a problem and so if you're applying for a grant you want to get the money so you can pay your mortgage and you can fund your laboratory and so you're just going to write a grant that's going to fulfill the expectations of the grant reviewers because you know what they what they think is probably true because they're your colleagues so I think anyone in the audience can understand why this causes a serious problem in terms of how science explores the parameter space of the possible. Now, I'm saying this in an abstract way, but I think the most concrete cases have to do with cancer research, 
um, where there's been a lot of reporting, and I've heard that this is true, uh, there are particular avenues of advancement in cancer research that continue to get funded, which seem to return no results. But the reason they continue to get funded is everybody in that area is reviewing everybody else's grants and all of the labs are invested in a particular question and answer. Um, so one can imagine like the sociology of science is now, now resulting in a lot of waste, um, less boldness, less out of the box thinking. And basically um, they're just collecting rents uh, within the institution. So they're doing the same, the same experiments over and over again not getting the results, but they don't get the feedback of not getting their grant approved uh, because, well, I mean, they're helping each other. They're scratching each other's backs. Right? So, I mean, I think that's a dynamic. I mean, this is a small part of academic science. There's all sorts of other things like relating to what the journals mean and how many publications academics have to publish. I mean, a lot of people, they just need lines on their CV. I mean, that's a term, as you probably know, lines on your CV, but that's not what science should be. No. Science should be results, should be advancement. But what, what people measure are lines on their CV. And so you're measuring something different than what you're notionally actually putting forward as a proposal. And um, so these are huge structural problems. Even if we strip away the political correctness that we're alluding to here, the, uh, the social conformity, these are still huge structural problems that are there. And um, I think, you know, sometimes institutions, sometimes institutions uh, get too sclerotic and they need to be abolished and refounded. And that might yeah. be a fundamental issue that we need to do here. We need to break the bonds of the, uh, break the bonds between um, various academic groups and how they collaborate and how they scratch each other's backs. Like all these things are happening because over the generations and over the decades, these lab groups have kind of evolved almost into a self-sustaining organism. And they, these organisms, they feed on grants. And so they're optimized they're optimized to extract grants out of the system. They're not optimized uh, to produce results. Results are a side effect. Yes. Razib, I agree with you. The bureaucratization of science is a better predictor of decline than political correctness. So, so for example, many politically incorrect researchers where works are published in intelligence, that great journal. However, I think we need to study the nodes of cancer culture. So for example, my research could be extremely controversial, but I am only canceled when someone with influence on Twitter says, wait, this research is really controversial. I should get rid of him. So cancer culture op operates within a particular node. It's, it's yeah. not applicable to all to all parties. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree. I agree. It's a, uh, I mean, it, it's a symptom. Uh, it's not the cause is maybe perhaps the way I would explain it. I mean, it would not be, it would not be relevant in a healthy academic, e in a healthy academic ecosystem, people would denounce each other all the time, but that's fine. They have strong disagreements. It's not like that didn't happen in the past. Like think about like, you know, the conflicts between Newton and Hook and, you know, academic, academic, um, Rivalries can get quite nasty. Uh, R.A. Fisher and, and Sewell Wright, well, mostly Fisher, uh, they didn't really get, get along by the end of their life, you know? Yes, and cancel culture is not new to our era. We, we, we all can write and talk about medieval cancel culture. The difference between medieval cancel culture and cancel culture in our era is that cancel culture in the past was more contentious and political. So today you can be canceled for saying a man can never be a woman, a very tedious opinion yeah whereas yeah. in the past the, the political import of of canceling someone was really serious yeah 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 and well that, i mean well i mean yeah i mean like in terms of like the, their life was in danger but i mean to not have a I mean, like, I mean, you're a young man. I mean, I, I don't know your life situation, but if you're like a 50 year old researcher and you have a whole community and you have a family and you have all these obligations, uh, are you going to take a risk to become unpersoned? You know, no, they're not going to do that. So, no. And, and then m money really matters. So, for example, libertarians have studied the relationship between rent seeking and grant funding. So, uh, so you are correct. Many re researchers are invest are investing in what I call institutional protectionism, in yeah. the sense that a view that's politically diplomatic and expressed by other 
researchers is invested and receives funding at the expense of other research. So there's a crowding out effect in research and science more broadly. Yeah, yeah, no. I, so I think, uh, I think like um, the allocation problem is a serious um, consideration. No, so here's, here's an issue that, so Matt, Matthew Iglesias brought to my attention the issue that, you know, so I'm on the right, um, so I, I hadn't think about this. Uh, liberal elites are captured by their by the professional classes. The professional classes are liberal, you know. So why why is why is there like this debate whether Stephen Breyer should retire and you know not be replaced by Biden when the Senate is under Democratic control? Politically, it's just a no no brainer, correct? But um, but culturally, um, Iglesias's argument is lawyers have their own norms aside from politics, and they want to elevate the status of their own profession. And they have professional norms, so that interferes with the political calculus. Conservatives don't have the problem because there's very few conservative lawyers. There's not much of a conservative legal establishment, and their goal is just to appoint conservatives, right? Okay, so that's a general insight. So let's say you're a politician, you want to reform science. Who do you talk to about reforming science? Scientists. Yes. What are they going to say? There's no problem. They're going to ask you know? for more money. Yeah, <laughs> they're going to ask more money. Uh, let's like. Let's extend the system. Let's build like you know new institutes. So fundamentally, the issue here is we have a, a culture of specialists who are invested in the system, and they should be. That's their rational interest. So how are the politicians going to get around this? Um, you know, you need some courage. You need some boldness. And I mean, nobody is super is interested enough in this topic to do that. Like I can imagine, perhaps like a state, like maybe a Republican state like Texas, um, perhaps someday in the future just saying enough, enough with the system, we're gonna do something different and just uh, dissolve. I mean, this is a dream, but I mean, this is, this is possible. Dissolve the UT, the University of Texas system and recreate academia from the ground up in a different way. Now, institutions evolve. This is, this is not going to be like a perfect system forever, but my point, and I think you agree with me, is we need to break the current bonds and the current sclerosis and almost anything else, restarting and rebooting would be better. It's like rebooting a computer. Yes, the computer will eventually get, you know, bloated and you'll need to reboot it and, and whatnot. I mean, this is not as true today with operating systems, but you know, you get you get my point. Sometimes you just need to reboot the system and have a clean slate. And so I think it would be useful if a state like Texas tried that and see how it worked. Yeah. Let, let's talk about climate change. Climate scientists are the major ben beneficiaries of research in some cases. But let me tell you what we do know about climate change based on my analysis of the data. The climate is always changing. With or without us, the climate will change and the effects of climate change are not uniform. And fortunately, CO2 has a well-documented fertilization effect. We also have enough data and research tracking how, how, how humans have adapted to climate change over the years. So smart researchers should actually be saying, if we are serious about tackling the threat of climate change, these policies are better than X policies based on historical research. We really should not be promoting the hysteria of people like Greta Thunberg. But instead, we're only getting hysteria. Yeah, well, so in terms of climate change, I, I'm going to be entirely frank. I haven't tracked this issue since the early 1990s, probably before you were born. Um, I used to be super into it when I was a kid, and obviously I've gotten into genetics and other issues. And as you know, when you get um, immersed in a scientific field, sometimes you can uh, lose touch with other areas. And so um, in the next couple of years, I will be catching myself up uh, because people keep asking me um, my opinion. And I'm going to be entirely frank. I don't have an informed opinion because I, you know, I just, I just haven't kept track of it. Uh, you know, as you know, I've had to deal with controversies on my own. Um, I have to keep up on the literature in my own area. And so I don't have a strong uh, scientifically informed opinion about climate change and climate science and what's going on in that field. I will say in the general um, schema, I think we need to think a lot of cost versus benefit. Exactly. Uh, and um, I don't think that people think in that way enough. And, um, you know, uh, so I, let me give you an example where people don't think like in terms of like adaptations. You know, people, um, you know, people talk about how I, my, my family's from Bangladesh. People talk about how all oh, Bangladesh can get totally destroyed by climate change because it's going to lose like like 10 to 20 percent of its like uh, land area in the next couple of centuries. OK, that's fine. Let's just stipulate that. OK, let's just stipulate that um, because of the low. 
low sea levels. The issue right now is 75% of people in Bangladesh are today are rural, rural residents, mostly subsistence farmers. Do we presume that in a hundred years, Bangladeshis will be mostly subsistence farmers? Like we can imagine a situation where they're mostly urban, they mostly work in like, you know, manufacturing and service in a hundred years. Um, so does it really matter as much if 10 to 20% of the surface area is gone? So my point there is, um, this is a problem if you have a dispersed rural population. It's less of a problem if the population is highly urbanized and you have people living in Asian mega cities. And so I just think people need to think about these sorts of things when they talk about climate change because they just assume, okay, let's assume current conditions, project 100 years in the future and that's how it is. But the reality is people are gonna adapt, people are gonna change. Um, here in the United States, I know for a fact that um, in Oregon's Willamette Valley, they're looking at uh, grapes, at um, varietals that are more adapted for Northern California, uh, for Napa, and Napa is looking at uh, varietals that have traditionally been adapted for Southern California, the San Juanes Valley, and so everything is shifting north. Now, probably it's not feasible to grow wine in uh, the San Juanes Valley in the near future, right? That's just a, a thing that's gonna happen. You know, I did my graduate work at UC Davis and there's a water uh, institute there. And they talked about like how California will need to adapt in the near future. So one issue with California is, as you know, the water pricing system is just crazy. Like if they had a rational water pricing system, there would be no problem, but they don't have a rational water pricing system. The water pricing system is a patchwork and it goes back a century in many cases. And uh, some farmers are strongly incentivized uh, to use all the water they can because they only, they don't really pay for the water, but they lose their allotment if they don't use it. It's a totally irrational system. And so, you know, we're, we're leaving, we're leaving uh, abilities to adapt and innovate and handle the situation on the table because of our inability to think rationally in terms of cost versus benefit. Now, ultimately, I think we probably will adapt. I think like nature kicks you in the face enough and you'll institutionally adapt. But, um, you know, I think what people should be doing in California right now, for example, you know, I don't like, this is not my like highly informed view, okay, yeah. just to be clear here, but they should just be like, you know, allowing the development in the urban areas, create vertically, move some of these people away from um, you know, living on top of hills, uh, beautiful, it's a beautiful house, but you know what, there's going to be a fire there at some point. Um, so one, the fire threat would be reduced if people pack themselves into the cities. And we know California has issues with uh, not allowing density because of the land use laws, which are, um, you know, basically it's NIMBYism, but they use it, they use environmental regulations to enforce NIMBYism. Water should be rationally priced. So this way, um, you know, nobody would have a problem because the people that need the water would pay for the water. The almond almond growers should not like be paying like 1% as much as someone, as a city of San Francisco. Well, San Francisco actually has a good good deal. So, you know, like the different jurisdictions, they have different sources of water based on like, you know, earlier contracts and stuff like that. So the whole system is a patchwork. It's totally irrational. And that's why we have issues with water and fire in California. Um, you know, if you're a wealthy person and you decide to build your house on top of a beautiful hill. I mean, like, and, and then you then you expect the state uh, to send a helicopter with flame retardant to prevent the fire from burning down your beautiful house. I mean, that's a risk you take. Like, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to realize building in a very dry area on top of the hill is basically telling the, the fire to burn your house down at least once every 10 years, you know? And so anyway, I just went on a rant. I lived in California, so I've thought of a little bit about some of these things and I've talked to people and this is just all, a lot of this is just human created irrationality. That exactly. And, and Rajiv, the review of geophysics in 2019 made a bold statement. Climate pessimism and climate optimism are both off target. And based on what we do know, there may not be a strong correlation between rapid climate change and mass extinctions. We also do know that global warming historically has been linked to biodiversity. And there's a stronger correlation between warming and economic growth than cooling and growth. 
So the climate will always change. The climate is changing, is changing, but if it must change, we should prefer global warming to global cooling. Yeah, um, I need to think about that because I mean, biodiversity is not always good, man. Like You're mosquitoes, right. mosquitoes exactly. and pathogens, it's not good for us. It's good, it's good, it's good for the diversity indices, right? Um, so, uh, so for example, you know, as you know, uh, tropical areas are subject to a greater pathogen load for various reasons. Uh, and so as the tropical areas expand, as the subtropics expand, it's just something humans are going to deal with. Um, you know, and so, I mean, there, again, there's trade-offs, there's cost for benefit. We need to think about it rationally. That's all. I'm not a, I'm not a doom, I'm not a doomsayer, but neither am I, um, I, I would say that my position is you're a realist. We, need to, we, we need, yeah, we need to adapt. That's just, we're going to adapt or we're not going to adapt. I think if you want me to put my money on it, I think we will adapt, but I think there is a chance that, I mean, it's like, um, it's like a financial, like, it's like a financial crisis. Like, I think there's going to be a financial crisis in this country due to debt field spending. Um, but I mean, obviously we could avert it if we choose to. So do we choose to do certain things or not? I mean, you know, do we, uh, you know, with the, California, it could fix a lot of its problems. Do they choose to? That's up to them. Um, you know, Miami will probably be exposed to more hurricanes. Um, but I mean, we know how to build, like their place, like Tokyo is exposed to hurricanes and earthquakes. That doesn't mean that people say that they should not live in Tokyo. It just means that you need to build in a certain way uh, that's in keeping. Now there are issues, like I live in Texas, there are issues in Texas where people choose to live in flood prone areas and the houses um, are frankly not super robust a lot of the time. And that's a choice that they make. Uh, it's not, I mean, so they, you know, I know people who've lost their houses in Houston from the floods a couple of years ago, but the houses are so much cheaper than in California. They're so much cheaper than a lot of other parts of the country. So this is like, a, I mean, I, you know, I don't want to be harsh about it, but you took a risk and it didn't work out. And that's life in a yeah, way. That, that's life. So, so. so for example, Rajib, let me, let me give something that's directly related to what we're doing now. I'm a YouTuber. I submit an email, the person may say yes, or you may say no. I may submit 20 emails and I get one response. Personally, that's not a problem because usually if you're a smart person, you're going to submit several emails. So if 20 people say no, two may respond. And if two respond in one week or one day, you may do two interviews, but most people don't think rationally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, well, I mean, people, I mean, the issue is like with rationality is you need to step back and evaluate the the ups and the downs. And we're not, um, a lot of us are not designed that way. Like and that's evolution because, you know, I do think it is a fact that we are, you know, evolved in a certain context, social, social context, and we're taken out of that. Um, we need to be trained and we're not trained. Um, we're not trained to evaluate rationally. And, you know, some of this could be just be cultural. I mean, some of it's dispositional. Like people have said, um, uh, people have said that, uh, you know, I'm a little bloodless, a little, uh, like I lack the soul. So in a way, um, I'm probably better equipped to evaluate certain things just because I lack something that other people have. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but other people could, you know, they could be trained to be like me, I think. Um, in certain contexts, you don't have to be like me all the time, you know. I'm, I'm just trying to say that like, it's possible. So for example, um, I'm an atheist. If I tell a Muslim person from certain countries that I'm an atheist, they kind of get really uncomfortable because they're not conditioned to like, to be comfortable around people who will admit that to their face because they think it's such an offensive thing. Yeah. It's like saying that I copulate with my sister, you know? <laughs> you should, they're not, they're not, they can't like handle it, but that's a cultural thing. You know, in the United States, it's not as much of an issue, obviously. And so, um, you know, we can change in terms of how we evaluate things. But um, I think that has to do with change from top. I think our leaders uh, are pretty venal. They lack virtue. I think they're pretty corrupt. And I think it cuts across a lot of our elite, unfortunately. I'm not very um, optimistic for that reason. Yeah, well, people say that you, you are cold, but I think I'm a colder person. Yeah, yeah. I mean, definitely get, get that feeling, man. Yeah, I'm it's, really harsh. Is it all the jerk chicken? Well, no, it's not because of Jamaican jerk chicken, but Jamaican jerk chicken is really good. Okay, okay. And, and what, what's interesting is that I'm from a normal family. So my, my parents value success. They're hardworking people. They didn't attend a fancy university. They went to high school and maybe they didn't get all of their qualifications. But even at six, I was very 
harsh and cold. And I'm not mm -hmm. from a very rich part of Jamaica. So in many cases, I am an anomaly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so, I mean, maybe you should uh, adopt the same name as, as Jonathan Anomaly. <laughs> <laughs> you actually know him. I mean, no, I'm sure you do. Talk to you. I don't really know much about you, but I can immediately know you know Johnny. So. Yeah, but our, our last point on climate change. Let's say, for example, because of climate change, the land mass will recede. Is this a problem? Yes, but it's not a problem for rich countries. With the, with the advent of plant-based meat and biotechnology, a decline in land mass is not a big deal. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, mean, I, I think that that's true. Um, I think rich countries have the resources to adapt. Um, I think they will adapt. I think there's going to be some problems in some of the poorer countries with, with bad governance, um, honestly. And I mean, I mean, look, we see problems even today. Even today, there's, you know, I, but a lot of this is, um, so I wrote, I wrote something for The Guardian many years ago. And basically, my argument was that the issue with the, the issue is not, um, the issue is less even climate change than it is uh, the sh the inability of human social systems to react rationally to climate change. So the way we react and adapt to climate change is through our social systems adaptabilities. But if the social system is brittle and then it collapses, we got a whole lot of other problems, right? So if the supply chain, the distribution system breaks down, humans regress. Like, so I lived in Texas, I was in Texas during um, the other snowpocalypse this February. I saw things, I saw people on the edge of desperation, upper middle class people that relied on Uber and other things. Like people who are curious can read my Substack uh, about it, but um, like you go to receive.substack.com, just uh, check, uh, just do Duke Tales. It's a relatively recent thing. So I saw people that were like tech bros, upper middle class who relied only on food delivery, okay? Food delivery stopped. So they were hungry. They didn't have any food in the house. Uh, you know, they started, I mean, you could tell that they were like, people are looking around, like, how do you survive? Like, what's going to happen if we don't have water or electricity for another couple of days? And so my point is, you know, society goes along and it's fine until it's not. And so I'm worried about the shocks to the social system if people don't adapt and prepare well. And if people like kept their heads, if they kept their heads, they would be fine, but they're not going to keep their heads. Okay, they're gonna start burning stuff down. They're gonna start like doing crazy things. And once once it goes down that road, there's a, a feedback loop. Yes, it's just like with the issue of COVID. My take on COVID is quite clear. Pandemics for a long time were persistent because of modern technology. They became an anomaly. COVID will be around for a period of time. We need to accept that and move on. I don't have time for hysteria. That's fair. Yeah, my yeah, I'm not going to lose sleep because of COVID. It doesn't make sense. And people die, and that's unfortunate. But in the grand scheme of life, people will die. It's just a part of life for people to die. Mm -hmm. And so well, I'm sorry. Well, to be fair, to be fair, do you have children? No, I don't have children. Okay, have I don't kids. think I don't th I don't think you'll say it in exactly that way once you have children. Because when you think of your children dying, you're not going to think of grand schemes. <laughs> yeah, so I, I don't have kids. Do you have kids? Yeah, I'm just saying that having a child is like having a child is the biggest transition in a human's life, and a lot of people don't make that transition today. So that that's a whole sociological. That's a different conversation. Yeah, yeah. And I haven't thought about it in detail, but I'm just th saying there are that, also genetic implications to having children. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but I I, I I I don't have kids that you yeah. know of. Yes. Repeat that you know of oh i don't have kids that i know of okay i don't have them yet <laughs> yeah but i i i've i've looked I, I i can't okay if i were to have children what would they be like that's a story for another time yeah yeah no it's, i i just point, i'm just pointing out that it's easy to be cold and analytical and rational before you have children you know yes. because you're 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 outside it's like you're outside of i mean i'm gonna be entirely frank in a way you're not fully you don't need to be fully integrated into human society, you know, because you don't, you're going to end, you're going to end someday. Okay. But once you have children, you will die, but part of you will continue. Okay. And so now your time horizon is like, you're looking yeah, longer. 
Yeah, you're looking into the future and you're not, it's not as cold for you because you don't, you can't be as cold and calculating because it's not just about you because you yourself can be cold and calculating for you. But when you have a child, uh, we'll see. Some people probably still are cold and calculating, but um, I think like it changes. I mean, we know it changes men hormonally. Yeah, but you but know. Rena Radib, you're giving me an idea. Maybe I should have children. I don't like stupid people. I like cold and calculating people. So maybe if I have children, they can spread my message. If I've you never... can't pro- if you can't proselytize, procreate. Yeah, you, you, you're you're so I I am in the business of evangelizing. But if I were to have kids, then I would never die. Yep. I when I when I had my first um. When she was little, I had my first, I had like a taxi driver and he was just like, uh, you know, he's like a working class black guy and yeah. he had like six kids. And so I was like, yeah, like I just, you know, anyway, I was coming back from the airport and he was just like, he's like, oh man. And he's like, looked at me, he turned around. He's like, you're a God now. Remember that you're God <laughs> now. And I, I was just like, well, that's weird. You know, he's like, you made a human man. And I was just like, whoa, that's weird. You know, anyway, it's just, it really struck with me. Like, I obviously don't think I'm literally a God, but I understood, like, it hit me. Like, you look at your child, your child is born, they open their eyes and they look at you and you're just like, whoa, like, this is miraculous. And, you know, I'm a materialist, I'm an atheist, whatever, but it's just like, there's an amazement to to that child. And as the child grows up, my kids are older now. And um, I just think, uh, I think, you know, like, like the Hindus have this like idea that you go through stages in life. And I don't feel like we go through stages of life anymore. It's just like, whatever you want to do, choose. You want to be child-free and travel? Yeah. Go ahead and do it. And I think that's, again, I'm, I, I believe in free choice. People should be able to do it. But I think they're missing something yeah. uh, in their, the fullness of their humanity. Let me be entirely frank. Yeah. Can you imagine? With children, the Lipton Matthews Publishing Company will never end. <laughs> yeah, it will end. They could even be smarter. My yeah. God. Yeah. Uh, a it depends Lipton. on your mate. Dep- yeah, depends yeah. On who you're picking, man. A lip, a world with a Lipton 2.0 or 4.0. What would he achieve? Maybe two Nobels. I don't know. <laughs> Inshallah. Yeah, but let's talk about your article briefly. Why conservatives should embrace evolution as a jewel of modern Western civilization? Why should they? Well, I mean, because uh, you know, if you're a Burkean, uh, if you believe in experimentation and iteration. Um, and you believe in contingency and, uh, you know, tacit, implicit wisdom in organic systems, uh, in social systems that you can't always understand, that is evolutionary process, okay? So it's the same thing, just on a biological time scale. Now, ultimately, do I think that it, um, if you're a creationist, do I think that that means that you can't, you know, think about policy in a rational way? No, not necessarily, but, um, there's a couple of things that, are, that, that were going on and why I wrote that. Uh, the Federalist published something that was kind of creationisty, although I talked to the author and he himself was not very creationist, so it was kind of a, titled in a weird way. But, um, you know, in the United States, uh, evangelicals have traditionally been creationist. And it's a big culture war thing. I just think they need to give it up because one, no one cares. Yes, two, exactly. They're lo- two, they're losing. Three, um, they allow, it allows conservatives to be tarred and brushed as like anti-intellectual no left nothing. It's not good for our brand. And so we're losing people on the margin, on the edge, who might be open to our message. I'm not saying that you have to be an atheist materialist. I'm not saying that at all. But I'm saying that evolutionary science and evolutionary biology is a pretty robust field. And, you know, you, I, I'm not religious, obviously, but you can believe in God and how, it, you know, whatever. All I'm trying to say is the science itself is pretty straightforward, and it's actually arguably cognizant with a lot of insights from conservatism and social conservatism, you know, in terms of, uh, you don't know, I mean, adaptation, functional adaptation is adapting to systems, and it is um, accruing wisdom over millions of years, okay? Like, I mean, yeah, we could redesign a we could redesign a giraffe or something like that. But there's probably lots of things we're gonna miss. You know, like you can think of it from a Burkean perspective, a Hayekian perspective. But um, you know, evolution is about experimentation. It's about little experiments and then learning from your experiments. It's not about like top down rational planning. And so, I mean, what could be more more in alignment with American conservative thought? You know, at least like today, uh, than this sort of process. So we can learn a lot from it. 
And like now, you know, with like all this gender stuff and social constructionism, there's whole fields of biology that are talking about sex differences. Yeah. Conservative, now, yeah, yeah. conservative like spontaneous order, and you're saying that spontaneous order is a, is parallel with evolution. Very simple argument, quite lucid. Nothing to blow the brain. Yeah, yeah. But you yeah, know, the, yeah. you know, Razib, I'm religious. I would even call myself a fundamentalist. But I'm going to be honest. We, earlier we said that science is declining. Philosophy is also declining. Eco well, I wouldn't know. Economics is actually doing quite well for various reasons. Economics is still the, the old nerdy field. So when economists publish studies that are really, as some would say, based, they don't get much backlash because it's just economics. People really make the link between economics and genetics and culture. And then economic economists tend to write in a very diplomatic language so it's highly unlikely for them to be cancelled but we're seeing a decline that's across subjects so for example when are we going to see the modern day augustine or the modern day aquinas or duns quotas i don't know if you have read duns quotas but whenever i'm reading a, a, a philosopher and he's very complicated i don't shy away from his argument but duns quotas his arguments for god are really complicated so i couldn't finish it it's really hard but mm -hmm. when are we going to experience the brilliant men of god again or the brilliant philosophers so there's a a, a widespread the decline in, in, in Christian thought. So for example, I'm very religious, but the Bible is a philosophical and the Bible is a philosophical and ethical tome providing guidance as to how we should live. All biblical stories could be unreal, yet God is great and exists. Christians should understand that if God is real and taken literally, it doesn't mean that the Bible ought to be taken literally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, 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 the, well, there so, is a relation. I, I, I will, I'll give you um, a, a, I think a hypothesis that I have why Christian philosophy is in the state it is. And this is just like the pipeline problem. Uh, the most brilliant minds of the generation are going to theoretical physics, not Christian philosophy. Exactly. It's not, we're not in the medieval ages again when theology was the queen of, the sci of sciences. Yeah, exactly. so I think, I, I, think, I think that's the fundamental issue. It's a pipeline problem and, um, you know, uh, you, know, you put, you know, output is conditional to some extent on input, you know, so perhaps Christians need to invest in artificial general intelligence and, uh, you know, th that will be the great theologian. Because, yeah, and, you know, and, and I, also I also find that Christian arguments for the existence of evil are extremely sloppy. So Michael Lou Martin was the, in my opinion, the best atheist of his generation. Did you read Michael when he was alive? Uh, are you know my atheism a philosophical justification? Yes. Yeah, I read that in the 1990s. Yeah, but yeah, M Michael is very, was very smart and Michael responded to a brilliant argument in, in, in favor of Christian theodicy. And uh, the, he was responding to a professor who was affiliated with Yale at the time. But Christians often say, okay, God gave us a free will. He does not want robots. Okay, that's an obvious argument. Don't invoke that premise in, in, in a serious debate. Why is there evil? Well, if we view God as a rational character who created a perfect world that was corrupted by sin, then a logical consequence is evil. So I subscribe to the natural law perspective on theodicy, which unfortunately is not popular in the Christian church. And I'm guessing that is unpopular because Christians I don't like thin thesis and logical thinking apparently these days. It's quite well, I mean, well, I mean, I think if you're talking about American Christianity in particular, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, American Christianity, radical Protestantism, and this is like totally off topic. I, I think, um, I think there's a serious, like speaking as a non-religious person, um, I think uh, 1519 uh, was a problem insofar as it opened the door to a radical individualism that kind of uh, dissolved a lot of the bonds of, of the institutional structure of the Christian church and the Protestant world. And you know, you had like this extreme populism that kicked in. And um, instead of like the doctors of the church guiding the people, 
the people are pushing the doctors of the church. I mean, there are no doctors. There are no real doctors yeah, of the church. Razib, Razib, you are right. The Protestant Revolution promoted individualism as a libertarian. I am individualistic, and I've also observed a, a link between individualism and social outcomes like innovation. But the Protestant Revolution was anti-philosophical and anti-rational. It was. Yeah. yeah. Pro pro yep. pro Protestants en encourage a childlike form of analytical worship. Yeah. The, the I mean, I mean, I, we need to, we need to, I mean, I will be, I, I don't want the comments to come in. Like there are like sophisticated reformed theologians. Yeah. And, yeah. But that's, that's a minority view. It's a minority view. The reality is the way Protestantism has trended in the United States in particular is more towards emotion. Um, exactly. Almost like a consumer. And you know, uh, I was thinking, um, they're burning churches in Canada. And I was thinking like, well, I mean, you know, I know you're offended by them burning churches, but like, you know, in this country, the United States, you have churches that are storefronts in, in, uh, in, 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 um, you know, plazas and mall, little mini malls and stuff like that. And it's just like, you know, what kind of, what kind of religion is that, that you've debased yourself to be just another consumer good provided in a um in a mini mall you know and so I, that's and what is that that's that that is that's because there is no guidance from on high um and you know american protestantism has now devolved down to a consumer want Be because remember we some well not you because you're a smart guy and i went on your blog and i i recognize that you have been reading some of the big names in christian history and theology so you, you read philip jenkins book so obviously you are aware that for a long time the church preserved greco roman knowledge the Ro the medieval church believed in natural law and the principle of cause and effect even in antiquity it was taught that natural philosophy was the handmaiden of religion religion and science are compatible that was the belief in christendom for a long time but the, the, the Protestant Reformation forced Christian to view the Bible as a literal text. So, so there were even medieval philosophers who would say, if we're to understand the Bible, we should also read natural philosophy and gain insight into God's creation, physically, that is. But with the Protestant Reformation, Christianity became fundamentalist. So God created the, the world, he separated the sea, and it, it was fundamental. It was no longer metaphorical or scientific. Mm -hmm. so, to, so today, Protestants are quite emotional. So for example, the 80s argues, God is a genocide. The Protestant are, well, I, I, can't, I cannot even fashion a response that's, that's coherent. But maybe the typical response is that, oh, you're taking the Bible out of context, or there's a difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament represents the God of law. The New Testament re represents the God of grace. When the Christian could simply say, look, well, I'm a, this is my own view and response. I'm a biblical realist. God is perfect, but sin corrupted the world. And then the effect of sin is a genocide. And even though God is perfect, he's a rational character. And, and the God of the Bible loves us, but he doesn't love us equally. Some are loved and others are favored. Therefore, if people A who represent the infidels, if they are against God's word, then it makes sense to kill them. I may sound harsh, but this is a logical response. It could make sense to kill them, even their children and babies. Why, what, no, and seriously, why would you allow the women and children to survive? Women socialize children. So if you're going to kill the men, you're stupid because women are responsible for transferring culture. So if- Okay, the, <laughs> I mean, you know, you're being, you're being a little cold here. Um, I personally find it um, uh, bracing, but uh, like I can see, I can see why people, people come after you, Lipton. Yeah, but <laughs> let's, let's be realistic. If, if God is just, orderly and rational and his people are being attacked by infidels why would god say spare their women and children that doesn't that's infeasible that's a silly recommendation in the realm of geopolitics you you want to kill their men and subjugate their women and children to prevent the transmission of culture 
So God is not evil. Sin corrupted the world, but because God is rational and he has endowed us with reason, he will not intervene in the earthly realm to prevent us from being wicked. Sure. I mean, I can see the logic. You yeah, know. It's, it's quite logical. You don't need to apologize for the so-called brutality of God. Use logic and philosophy to defend him. If you must, if you are an ap apologist for Christianity. Yeah, no, yeah. No. But I mean, I think the key issue um, that I want to just loop back to on this is my insight or my belief about American Protestants growing up in this country is that, you know, it, it's not about logic, it's about feeling. And that's uh, the fundamental issue with Christianity. And that's why Christianity has collapsed over the last generation, because when when you're um, when your defenses are feeling, um, those are weak defenses. Yes, but we're, we're wrapping up a bit. So I wanted to talk about your, your article on the Khoisan written several years ago. I doubt the ancestors of the Khoisan were ever the most numerous human population on this planet. For those who don't know, who were the Khoisans? Yeah, Khoisan just refers to people uh, in Southwest Africa that speak a particular set of languages that tend to have cliques. Um, and so the Khoi are pastoralists. Uh, they tended to be cattle herders. They were present around the Cape when the Dutch arrived in the 17th century. Um, there's not too many of them left, although in uh, Namibia, I think the Nama people are the, the best, or they're the most numerous of the Khoi. Um, and so uh, they are, they're pastoralists still to this day. And then, um, you know, the, the San, so San is actually an exonym. So it means it's a name given to them by their Bantu enemies. So, you know, they don't like to be called San, but it's become politically correct. So Khoi San, but um, they, you know, calling them Bushmen is actually more politically correct in South Africa. Um, so they're hunter gatherers, uh, unlike the Khoi. And, um, but they're same general, um, you know, they speak like click languages, genetically, they're kind they're obviously related to the Khoi. And so uh, these are the indigenous people of Southwest Africa, of Southern Africa more generally, actually. Um, and physically, um, they're quite di distinct from other black Africans um, in terms of like, I mean, you don't even want to, you might not want to say that they're black Africans. Like if you look at them, a lot of them have epicanthic folds, their skin is lighter, their, their hair texture is somewhat different um, and their facial features are somewhat different. So, um, you know, they're, they're uh, racially quite distinct. Yeah, and, and why would people assume that they were the most numerous human population on the planet? The reason is if you do whole genome sequencing, if you look at all 3 billion base pairs, uh, they have the most genetic diversity within their genes of any human population. That's not due to like recent, I mean, actually of any human population. I, I could look up the numbers, but I don't think there's any human population that would be greater. I'm making an except, I'm, I'm, I'm being quite careful here because um, the Cape Colors right to their south have a lot of Khoisan ancestry, but they also have Indian, East Asian, Bantu African and Northern European. But actually the numbers wouldn't work out because all those other groups are way more homogenous. So the Khoisan have the most genetic diversity within their genome, the most number of SNPs away from the reference populations. And so the stylized fact that I recently posted on a Substack article is there is more pairwise, like a diff for the programmers out there, there's more pairwise differences in SNPs between two Khoisan that are 50 miles apart than there are between a Han Chinese and a European. All right, and Razib. The Aaron invasion theory, it's controversial. Who were the, uh, the Aaron Razi? But tell us about them. We have done some fascinating work on the topic, but do so briefly. Yeah, uh, basically, uh, the Aryans are the Indo-Iranian speaking people. They're the Eastern uh, Eastern extension of like kind of the corded wear horizon. Uh, we now have uh, ancient DNA. It seems like they come from the Fatinovo culture of the Russian forest steppe. They moved east along the edge of the forest and the steppe into the Urals, into Kazakhstan, where they became the Santoshta culture. And then they expanded, moved into northern Iran, moved into India. Some of them moved into Syria. Obviously, in some of these places, they got assimilated and disappeared. But in Iran and India, um, they synthesized with the native populations, created these new cultures. But they were also dominant across the whole Eurasian steppe until the rise of the Turks. So the Scythians, the Sarmatians, all these groups are, are Iranian, they're descended from the Aryans. And the word Aryan just means free. Um, okay. And so, yeah. And the argument is politically contentious because some have claimed them as Indian, whereas others have said, no, they're actually from Eurasia. So this is why the argument is contentious. 
Yeah, I mean, they're, they're clearly from Eurasia, or they're clearly from Eastern Europe, okay? okay. I mean, the genetics is now very clear on that. Um, I can trace my Y chromosomal lineage to Belarus 4,500 years ago. Like, we have ancient DNA, and we can see the Y chromosomes moving south and east over time, and now it's like 20 to 25% of the Indian subcontinent has that Y chromosome. Yeah. Um, no. uh yeah. And and the Indo-Europeans were the most historically significant nomads of these steeps. This is an article written by an academic. You don't need to comment on the article, but I would just like to ask you this question: Why were they successful as Why were they so successful as colonizers? I think that probably it's because they were the first of the nomads, and so first uh, adoption advantage of a new technology. Uh, gives you huge, huge benefits. And so they adopted the nomadic lifestyle first, they innovated it, and then they created a social structure that um, leveraged that nomadic lifestyle. And so what you're seeing is just ascertainment bias so experimentation of early Indo-Europeans. The ones that we see today are the winners of intergroup competition. Um, and since nobody else had these, these social and uh, cultural, social and technolo social technologies and also just like material technologies, uh, it was a winner-take-all game. Okay, all right. And before I go, my last words on genetics. Razib, there are limits to, to, to genetic enhancement. So, for example, some studies are showing that there is a link between autism and rationality. So autism can be a disadvantage, but at the same time, someone with autism could be very rational. We don't know the autistic person will become a genius. So why would we edit the genes of an autistic person or someone who's predisposed to autism when that person could become the next Einstein? So there are, there are serious limits to genetic enhancements. Yeah, well, I mean, so this is like a trade-off where, um, so there's two issues. Um, one issue is something that might be advantageous for society might not be advantageous for the individual. Yes. Right. And so um, it could be that autistic individuals in particular are irrational in the individual level and they push innovation in directions that are outside the social bounds. And that helps society as a whole, even though they don't capture all of these uh, positive externalities or spillover effects, okay? So that's a problem. Um, the other problem is just on the individual scale. Um, as you said, there could be trade-offs, like there is some evidence actually for higher IQ individuals correlating risk of schizophrenia genes along with creativity. So let's say we eliminate schizophrenia from, from whole family lineages, which I think would be a good thing. Yes. But then we dampen creativity and that might be a bad thing. Exactly, so there's a trade-off. But, yeah. but I'm going to sound harsh again, but from a cost-benefit analysis, the positive impacts of a brilliant person can outweigh the societal disadvantages. So for example, Innovators, according to William Nordis, they get 2.2% of the value of innovation. We get the, re the remaining 97.8%. So the, the, the added effects of long-term innovations can be greater than the societal disadvantages. I mean, I think you're right. Yeah, from a cost-benefit analysis. So, so again, maybe I am right. We they, There are limits to genetic enhancements. I'm not saying that we shouldn't edit genes, but the cost of losing innovations could be so great that maybe we should allow people to be born as artists. Yeah, I mean, this, this is portfolio diversity. <laughs> yeah. If everyone was an artist, society would not function. But if nobody was an artist, perhaps we wouldn't have a society. Exactly. And then there's also the empathy, the, em the, the, the effect of empathy. We sympathize with artists. We are empathetic because of the existence of diseases. We, we, we can become more sociable. So instead of discriminating against someone with a disease or autism, over time, we mature and we begin to accept these people as individuals and value them and their worth as people. So diseases can make us better as individuals. I'm not saying I want children to be born with developmental disadvantages, but that's a positive effect of diseases that has not been studied properly. Maybe yeah. we're becoming more, more sympathetic to people because of diseases. Yeah, I mean, this is a complicated issue. Um, I think being a human is not just a, a simple utility maximization calculation. Uh, I, I, I do think that the older I get, the less, oh, less I'm convinced I am about some of these things that being a human is experiencing a lot of different things. Exactly. And, and you can't be happy all the time. Yeah, I'm not, so. Yeah, you should. Yeah, you, and and last point, 
I do have a big problem with atheists who care about meaning. Life can be meaningful without having meaning. If you're an atheist, you don't need to, to, to have meaning in life. You want your life to be meaningful. Okay, I mean, I, yeah, I don't, I, I, so I mean, what do you say? I, I guess I don't understand what yeah, you're Yeah, I, I don't at. like emotional atheists. If there's, if God does not exist, why should we even care about morality? Yeah, I mean, this is instinct though. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I do have a big problem with atheists who like to talk about the poor and egalitarian ethics. If you don't want to invest in the poor or if you choose to be immoral, that is your choice. If, 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 if God has been removed from the picture, then you can become God. Why do people who say that they're rational materialists care about the, the idea of God or meaning in life or even morality? I yeah, do I understand mean, the evolutionary arguments, and I do buy these arguments, but I like consistency. If you don't believe in God, not a problem. Yeah, I mean, this is that's a whole different discussion, and I'm probably not the best person to uh, argue with uh, that sort of thing because I'm not like a super egalitarian like some of these yeah, people. Yeah, yeah, but but Rajiv, I, I'm a cold guy. Sorry. I... Oh, you don't have to apologize. We're all children of God, Lipton. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I that's re- how you were made. Yeah, I, Razib, I really enjoyed this conversation and I interviewed Charles Murray. You should check out that interview. Like, Charles Murray is painted as a deviant character, he's a bright guy, but quite moderate. Like, Charles Murray doesn't care about racial differences in psychopathic traits or individualism or even self control. So, he, were, he was on the show and I wanted to delve into these issues, but he doesn't seem to engage or care much for the work of people like Richard Lynn. And before you go, do you follow the work of academics I deem to be particularly interesting, like Edward Dutton and Michael Woodley of Meany? Um, I, you know, I've heard of them a little bit. They've been in touch. Um, I've run into Michael uh, at conferences. He's a very interesting character is what I will say. Oh, have you met Ed? I interviewed Ed I, and Ed interviewed me. I haven't I haven't met Ed, but I met Michael. Oh, uh, you have met con- Michael. Inte- intelligence conference. Yeah, yeah. But uh and I know Chuck, by the way. He was you on know my who? podcast. I know Charles. Oh Charles Murray. Okay. I know him. he was on my podcast, but I've I've met him in real life too. Oh, 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 oh okay. All right. But yeah, I I'm a big fan of Ed. I think he's really productive. And what's interesting about Ed is that Ed has a PhD in theology and many of the new interesting researchers are outside of science because mainstream scientists are, are getting re- really boring. But I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm f- fond of dissident r- research. So David Becker, Richard Lane, I follow all of them closely. And what's the name of your podcast, Brown Shirts? Uh, no, it's uh, it's uh, Razib Khan's unsupervised learning. So if you just type it into Google, okay, like, yeah, podcast, I'm more okay. of a reader than than a pod, podcast person. But yeah, and I also have the benefits of obscurity. When you're not when you're when you're not famous like me, you can't talk about anything at all. Hey, you better watch it because <laughs> you keep talking about things and you're gonna get famous. E- enough people are not listening to me, so I can't continue to be radical. For now, for now, for now. <laughs> Wait 10 years, my friend. <laughs> okay, all right. God has a plan for you. <laughs> all right, then. But it's a pleasure to speak to you, Razib. All right, Take bye. Care. Take care, yeah. man.